Good afternoon and uh, welcome to our series 20, 2021 Philosophers now, devoted to the reinvention of philosophy and philosophical practices in French. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Catherine Malabou today. Catherine was visiting professor at NYU last year and she's currently professor at Kingston University in the UK and professor of comparative literature and European languages and studies at UC Irvine. I have been lucky to have known Catherine for a long time, and uh, I've been able to follow her very inventive philosophical path. She's today one of the most important French philosophers. I, I have read all her books, and I'm always admiring to see how she renews herself and can write now on anarchy as well as on the clitoris. Catherine wrote very original studies on Hegel, Heidegger, Kant, and she defined a key concept of her philosophy, plasticity. And she has moved on to, she has moved on to, to contemporary subjects such as neurology, trauma, artificial intelligence. Her last book, among many, many books, several books, uh, include Before Tomorrow, Epigenesis and Rationality, at, uh, published at uh, Cambridge Polity Press in 2016, and Morphing Intelligence from IQ to IA at Columbia Press in 2018. So uh, at the end of Catherine's speech, she will answer your questions, and you can already ask them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this lecture is being recorded and you can watch it again on our YouTube channel. Uh, Catherine, welcome to the Maison Française. Well, uh, thank you. Um, you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I want to first thank La Maison Française and Francois um, for inviting me and organizing uh, this beautiful series. And thank you to Guillaume as well for his help. In organization and Sophie. So Francois told me that I should present my work in the form of a self-portrait more or less. So um, it is a very risky exercise, um, but I will try. So as it happened, I already uh, made a self-portrait in the past in a book, in my book called Plasticity at the Dusk of Writing, a book that came out in English 10 years ago in 2010. In fact, at the time, uh, it was not exactly a self-portrait, but a conceptual portrait, the portrait of a concept, as Francois said, the concept of plasticity, that has been central to my work for years. So uh, at the time, I chose to present this portrait as a mask and more exactly as what is called a transformative mask. Transformative masks are found in indigenous cultures some of some Amer North American West Coast na native tribes. So these masks are plural, composed of multiple faces, and they are described by Levi Schwartz, the famous French anthropologist in, the, in those terms, I quote, these masks open like two shutters to reveal a second face and sometimes a third, a third one behind the second. So as I started preparing for the present talk, I discover that this metaphor of the transformative mask was still very valid and accurate to help me present the trajectory I have been following since Plasticity at the Dusk of Writing. So I will explain how I came to add some new faces and hinges to my mask. And in conclusion, I will try to expose um, what is the matrix of all the transformations of my mask. So um, there will be five main couples of faces in my presentation. The first one, trace and form. The second one, spirit and the brain. The third one, genetics and epigenetics. Uh, the fourth, neural plasticity and artificial intelligence. And the last one, form and explosion. So as you understand, it will be a kind of general recapitulation of my trajectory. So the first couple, uh, trace and form. 
uh, when I started to be mature enough to uh, and well to ask to raise philosophical questions, it was during my PhD. I discovered that the notion of form that is uh, totally central in Hegel's philosophy. Uh, this notion of form has been the constant target of philosophical deconstruction in the second half of the 20th century. As we know, the paradigm of inscription of the trace has replaced it, and this not only in critical theory and philosophy, but also in a predominant way in art. This repl replacement or displacement from trace, from form to trace, was the result, first of all, the result of the so-called deconstruction of metaphysics undertook by Heidegger and pursued by Derrida. Deconstruction, as we know, designates the challenging of the privilege given in the whole Western philosophical tradition to presence, eternity, and being. So the concept of form in Greek morphe was considered by the tenets of deconstruction the prominent expression of such a privilege, the privilege of presence. After all, it is true that ideas, substances, and being in its traditional sense are forms. So just to give you an example of this challenging of the notion of form, I read an excerpt from Form and Meaning published in Derrida's 1972 book, Margin of Philosophy, Margins of Philosophy. So in this book, Derrida claims that all notion of form, whatever the definition of form, belongs to traditional metaphysics. I quote, how could it be otherwise? As soon as we utilize the concept of form, even to criticize an other concept of form, we inevitably have recourse to the self-evidence of a kernel of meaning. And the medium of the self-evidence can be nothing other than the language of metaphysics. In truth, the concept of form cannot be and never could be dissociated from the concept of appearing, of meaning, of self-evidence, of essence. Only a form is self-evident, only a form has and is an essence, only a form presents itself as such." End of quote. The second reason that explains the displacement from form to trace is a change of paradigm in ethics as made obvious in Levinas's work. Levinas called visage in French, what's in the human face is precisely in his view, irreducible to a form. The other he says is never the one who I quote, appears in plastic form as an image or a portrait. For the other's beauty is the supreme presence breaking through its plastic form with youth for which it resists. Another quote, otherness can only break through its own plastic essence. And Levinas goes on, it is a pure trace. I quote again, this existence abandoned by all and by itself, trace of itself imposed on me, assigns me in my last refuge with an incomparable force of assignation, inconvertible into forms. Forms would give me at once a countenance. So I was very puzzled by this sentence. Trace is inconvert inconvertible into forms. Uh, to the extent that forms are congealing the alterity of the other. And the third reason that explains the displacement from form to trace is undoubtedly a new vision of artistic creation and gesture. An example of that is Deleuze's interpretation of Francis Bacon's painting in his famous book, Francis Bacon, The Logic of Sensation, where he substitute, substitutes the concept of figure for that of form. So figure and form are apparently identical, but in fact, they profoundly differ from one another. I quote Deleuze, the figure, being a body is not a face and does not even have a face. It doesn't have a head because the head is an integral part of the body. It can ev even be reduced to the head. As a portraitist, Bacon is a painter of heads, not of faces, not of forms, 
and there is a great difference between them. So the figure would then be, in a sense, the result of a neutralization of form. So I made this um, recalls in order to retrace the context in which I started to, let's say, philosophize. And immediately, I, I was not convinced uh, by these critiques. Right from the start, I was not convinced and I became less and less convinced. And I was not ready to dismiss the concept of form. And I still resist this dismissal. A recent discovery gave me new reasons to challenge these critiques. Recent discovery of an already old text in reality, which is Maurice Merleau-Ponty's Phenomenology of Perception, uh, to which I devoted my seminar last year at NYU. Finding inspiration in Gestalt theory, what Merleau-Ponty calls form is not a shape understood as the contour of a thing, but a totality that includes shape as one of its particularities. Form then never reduce, reduces itself to a shape. It can be defined, I quote Merleau-Ponty, as the dynamic of an organized entity. I give another definition from uh, uh, phenomenology of perception. A form is defined here as a field of forces characterized by a law which has no meaning outside the limits of the dynamic structure considered and which, on the other hand, assigns its properties to each internal point so much so that they will never be absolute properties, properties of this point. A form then is never, once again, an individual shape, but a moving context. It is a world in which each respective value depends on the state of total equilibrium. So in that sense, it is not at all assimilable to presence or any fixed substance, but designates a living totality. And of course, living totality, life is an important term here. It is important because Merleau-Ponty characterizes the body as a form, which is the schema, the body schema, that is a dialectical relationship between itself, the organism, and its milieu. Living beings, he says, are not oriented toward an objective world, but toward a living world, an environment that is organized meaningfully. So this became really essential to me. And this leads me to my second uh, hinge between two faces, spirit and the brain. That is the living uh, context which a form is. Right after my PhD, I was uh, very interested in the revolution that occurred in brain science around the 50s and became manifest at the turn of the 80s and brought to light, because this revolution brought to light the bodily reality of plasticity. I then discovered that there existed a strong coincidence between the philosophical concept of, plati of plasticity and its empirical reality, which provoked a turn in my way of thinking. Because from then on, I systematically tried to articulate the conceptual level of my research with a coinciding empirical one. Uh, I could not even now, and perhaps now even more than before, I could not remain at the level of pure abstraction without seeing how uh, the concepts are somehow uh, embodied in uh, empirical realities and, and the body itself. And the brain gave me a decisive opportunity to do so. Because of this, revol well, this revolution, the neurological revolution helped to bring to light that the brain was not a rigid architectural organ as described by traditional neurology with determined functions localized in specific regions, but on the contrary, that it was an ever-changing form open to external influences made of billions of connections variable in size and volume. So the functioning and organization of the brain exactly coincides with Merleau-Ponty's definition of form, 
a collective context, a community of points organized as a series of networks and made of thousand possible uh, connections, uh, future developments, collaborations. And neurologists today call this connectivity the global neural workspace in which all brain regions collaborate. This immediately leads me to explore the third couple of faces, genetics and epigenetics. And I remember giving a talk at NYU also uh, last year about um, uh, epigenetics. Brain's development is for its most part epigenetic, which means that innateness plays a minimal role in it. First of all, during the life of the fetus, most of the 100 billion neurons at work in the brain, as well as the innumerable synaptic connections that link them, are formed. Under the influence of experience of experiences lived in utero and later on during the first years of life, many of irrelevant or redundant connections are eliminated while others are consolidated. Such is the work of epigenesis, that is a gradual process of formation. We find the form here again. This process does not only take place during the critical periods of development, but throughout the life, the brain undergoes synaptic modifications imposed on it by experience. It means that brain development continues long after birth and depends to a large extent on environmental and cultural factors. Synaptic development is never the mere implementation of a program or code. On the contrary, it includes the spontaneous activity in the nervous system, in addition to activity provoked by interaction with the milieu. One of the fundamental challenges in contemporary neural biology is between program and individuation, and we'll find this problem again in artificial intelligence today. So in, is in between program and individuation, that is the elucidation of the relationship between the human genome and the phenotype of the brain. This relation opens the playing field or the middle ground between genetic determinism and the environmental selective imprint on the individual. So my inquiry about neural plasticity and the epigenesis uh, of the brain then led me to further explore the shift from genetic to epigenetic paradigm that recently inaugurated the post-genomic, the so-called post-genomic biological era. This new direction was largely a result of the sequencing of the human genome by the Human Genome Project. On 15 February of 2001, the American scientific journal Nature published the almost complete sequence of the 3 billion base pairs of the human genome. But the long awaited result was surprising. The human genome contains only 30,000 genes. And furthermore, it appears that these genes represent only 5% of the genome. Gathered in groups of clusters, the, code, the coding genes are separated by vast regions described as desert-like, constituted of junk or repetitive, that is, non-coding DNA. Depending on estimates, this non-coding DNA amounts to a quarter or third of the entire genome. This means that within the chromosomes, there are long chains of DNA, which so far as we currently know, do not correspond to genes and are associated with no particular function whatsoever. So it means that the sequencing of the human genome failed to provide the anticipated revelations. Far from proving that genetic determinism was all powerful, these results marked its demise. As French neurobiologist uh, Henri Atlan wrote, I quote, the idea that everything is genetic is starting to be seriously unsettled. A new model 
then appeared the idea that the totality or essential aspects of the development and functioning of living organisms is determined by a genetic program is gradually being replaced by a more complex model, one based on notions of interaction, reciprocal effects between the genetic, whose central role is not negated, and the epigenetic, whose importance we are gradually discovering. So here also, we find the idea that the living being is on the one hand coded, it is true, by the DNA, but on the other, for a large part, totally undetermined and open to transformation, different transformations. And we find again this definition of the form as a complex, as a context and a complex interaction of different uh, parameters hmm, that are definitely um, open to transformations. So I want to say a little bit more about the science called epigenetics, which is a neologism coined in 1940 by the British biologist Conrad Waddington. So epigenetics is a science that refers to the branch of molecular biology that studies relations between genes, precisely, and the individual features they produce. That is what is called the relation between the genotype and the phenotype, that is between the code and the individual translation of the code. So the adjective epigenetic therefore refers to everything to do with this interaction, including the mechanisms of expression and transcription of the genetic code without affecting the DNA. So for example, at the moment, the new vaccines, most of them, for example, the Pfizer vaccine uh, is an, what I call an epigenetic vaccine to the extent that it doesn't touch on the DNA, but work at the level of the RNA and produces epigenetic modifications of the virus in order for the body to react, um, to, to uh, strengthen its immunity against it. So um, immunotherapy today and the new vaccines use epigenetic mechanisms in order to function. And it is the, uh, in, it, in, even in cancer therapy, clearly epigenetic procedures appears, appear to be the future of uh, medical practices. So epigenetic plasticity can therefore be defined as I quote uh, from Mary, J Mary Jane West Eberhard in her book, Developmental Plasticity and Evolution. She says, epigenetic plasticity is the ability of an organism to react to an environmental input with a change in form, state, movement, or rate of activity. So I hope that you see the link between the defi Merleau-Ponty's definition of form that I use here as a model and what, what is happening today in biology, which is a clear uh, distancing from genetic determinism and an opening to new forms of development uh, that, uh, that uh, lay foundation on a kind of creativity of biology. And this creativity, this form creation is called plasticity. I now come to um, the following uh, hinge, my two new faces. Uh, neural plasticity and artificial intelligence. Here I have to mark a break hmm, that happened when uh, I wrote Morphing Intelligence recently, because uh, working on artificial intelligence, a great shift occurred in my research. Because until then, uh, notably in my book, What Should We Do With Our Brain? I had opposed neural plasticity to the functioning of machines and computers in particular. I challenge, for example, Bergson visions, Bergson's vision of the brain as a telephone or as a, a machine. But at the same time, the recent developments in artificial intelligence made me change my mind and fluidify 
the difference between the brain and a new kind of machine. It was a violent shock for me to realize a few years after my book, What Should We Do With Our Brain, but also uh, The New Wounded, that some of what I thought to be their important conclusions were inaccurate, that I was wrong, and that I had to revise my whole conception of plasticity. Because this suspicion brutally came to me when I read an article about the most recent computational architectures, and particularly about IBM's recent design of a totally new type of chip called the neurosynaptic chip. So the title of this, of this article was Eloquence. It was called IBM's Neurosynaptic Chip Mimics Human Brain. In clear, IBM was releasing a neurosynaptic computation chip that was able to simulate the neurons and synapses of the brain. Up until now, most computer chips have employed a von Neumann type architecture, the mathematics based system at the core of almost computer built since 1948 that executes instructions in series. And our, our computers, the one I'm using at the moment still works in this uh, von Neumann, according to this von Neumann uh, model. Um, but by comparison, the synaptic chip is made of different neurosynaptic cores or correlates that function autonomously in a non-synchronic way so that those which are not solicitated remain inactive, thus resulting in a lower energy use. So the chips or the chip functions as a brain with different intensity. Some parts of it are working while others are not. Um, so this is why it is said to mimic the brain because it allows interactions between neurons, the elements of calculus, synapses, the memory of the computer, and the variation of energy. Uh, the electronic synaptic components are capable of varying connection strength between two neurons in a manner very analogous to that seen in biological systems. <clears throat> so in a certain sense, the system develops what, what we might call its own experience. Let me uh, um, go on with IBM and uh, look at what Dharmendra Moda, the founder of IBM's Cognitive Computing, Computing Group at IBM Research, is saying. He developed with his team the first cognitive chip called True North. He says, if we think of today's von Neumann computers as akin to left brain, fast, symbolic, number crunching calculators, then True North, the synaptic chip, can be likened to the right brain, slow, sensory, pattern recognizing machines. True North's, he goes on, True North's correlates are designed for sensory applications that include things like artificial noses, ears, and eyes, adaptable, and being able to rewire synapses based on their inputs. So as we know, the, the, the right part of the brain is devoted to face recognition, form recognition. Um, it is the, the, the locus of emotions, etc. And so it is very interesting that Moda assimilates the new computing systems to the right brain, because these new computing systems, as I said, are supposedly able to um, hesitate, to improvise, to, as I said, varying their energy, etc. So then what remains of my previous affirmations concerning the irreducible, irreducibility of the brain to a cybernetic system. Um, and it is true that artificial intelligence 
is going farther and farther in the uh, mimicking of human intelligence. I know this is a very controversial book, but Ray Kurzweil, um, in, uh, in his book, uh, is saying, intelligence, I, I quote, intelligence indistinguishable from, in his book, Singularity, sorry, his big book, Singularity, says, intelligence indis indistinguishable from that of biological humans will become a reality. Machines will be capable of changing themselves. Once machines achieve the ability to design and engineer, engineer technology as humans do, only at far higher speeds and capacities, they will have access to their own designs source codes and the ability to manipulate them, just as we manipulate genetics, he adds. And, and a last quote, machines will be able to reformulate their own designs. So if this is true, of course it is very uh, sci-fi, but anyway, uh, it, he seems to describe a reality, undoubtable reality, because this is what appears in most recent artificial intelligence literature, if this is true, then we will have plastic machines, uh, plastic in the proper sense of form creative. And in that sense, it will become difficult to, uh, to differentiate or even oppose uh, natural, let's say, brain plasticity and uh, cybernetic plasticity. So the uh, definition of form I was giving in the, in the beginning, uh, uh, borrowed from Merleau-Ponty, the context, the world, uh, the multiplicity of points, et cetera, the networks. Uh, this model is becoming also accurate to describe what is happening in artificial intelligence. So then, as I said, uh, this discovery was uh, a blow uh, for me because then, uh, I was, I didn't know where to go and how to restart because it seemed to me that I was here touching a point of indistinction between the two plasticities, human and, and uh, mechanical. And then because I read many books saying, and I heard many people saying, no, 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 a machine will never be able to imitate us, etc. But I am convinced of the contrary. I took uh, the cybernetic literature very seriously. And so I said, if that's the case, then what kind of philosophy can we do? If it is true that one day machines can do what we do, and obviously some of them are already writing novels, uh, translating text, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, if one day a machine is able to write the critique of pure reason, simulate something like that, then, uh, what will become of us, uh, what will become with our forms. And so it, it was a real um, challenge and it took me, took time for me to recover uh, from that. So this brings me to my last phase form and explosion. And then I uh, remember that the term plasticity as I uh, first exposed it, in my first book had has three main significations. On the one hand, it designates the capacity of certain materials, such as clay or plaster, to receive form, to be malleable. On the other hand, it designates the power to give form, like the power of a sculpture or a plastic surgeon. Plasticity is the capacity to bestow form on the material. But finally, it also refers to the possibility to the possibility of the deflagration or explosion, that is of destruction, of all forms. As when one speaks of plastic, plastic explosive, or in French, plasticage, which simply means bombing. So the notion of plasticity is thus situated as both extremes of the creation on the one hand and the destruction of, on the other of form. So then I realized that perhaps what was happening to me was an explosion 
that after all, my own plasticity had to explode and that it was normal because after all, isn't, isn't all form doomed to explode one day in a way or another? So I thought that in the end, perhaps the lack of fixity of my model, the fact that artificial intelligence was threatening, threatening it, destroying it was a good thing. Because perhaps that in order to elaborate something like a thinking, a concept, an idea or a work in general, one has to accept that the form of this concept, of this idea, of this work can be able to destroy itself and explode. Uh, I think that philosophy has to be aware of its lack of duration, of its transience, of its fragility. And I had to remember at that time that in my first book, I, I said that plasticity uh, precisely could designate the formation of a form that proceeds out of destruction. This idea that there is a destructive plasticity, I, I found and I exposed in my book, Ontology of the Accident. It was one of my first books, so a long time ago. And I reread it recently. And in that book, I wrote, quote, no one thinks spontaneously about a plastic art of destruction. Yet, destruction too is formative. A smashed up face is still a face, a stump, a limb, a traumatized psyche remains a psyche. Destruction has its own sculpting tools. In, in The New Wounded also, my book called The New Wounded, I tried to acknowledge the destructive plastic power of wounds upon the psyche. So I don't want to uh, go back to what I said in that book about uh, brain disease, about Alzheimer's disease, about all those wounds who that create new identities out of destruction. What I want to underscore is that um, the fact that my previous ways of thinking uh, under, underwent that kind of explosion um, was on the one hand very depressing and on the other very refreshing as well because I discovered that after all uh, plasticity was really plastic that is able to destroy itself. So uh, this helped me to um, engage with new problematics uh, like uh, the revision of the transcendental as an answer to speculative realism. This, this kind of um, fragility of plasticity helped me to oppose any kind of dogmatic vision of reality. So we can go back to that in the Q&A, uh, like what, what I did with um, uh, the transience of plasticity against the dogmatic uh, position of speculative realism. I think that uh, realism uh, must, well, reality must, well, have, has something to do uh, definitely with the fragility uh, of plasticity. So, um, as I said, I would like, in order to, to conclude and, and uh, receive your, your questions, would like to conclude and um, elaborate what I think is the, perhaps the leading thread crossing all these different aspects of my work. And I think, because I was wondering, well, what, what is it? I think this is the concept of time since the beginning. Uh, it is a striking fact that since Heidegger's being in time, no real, genuine, important philosophical study of time has seen the light of the day. Because along with the critique of form, as I developed in the beginning, a new vision of becoming has emerged that could not be understood as temporality proper. So along with the dismissal of form, uh, a dismissal of time as a philosophical question also emerged. To go back, to come back to Derrida in his talk, La Différence, published in Margins of Philosophy, he precisely says that dif difference with an A 
should be substituted for time. He shows that there is no, no something like time any longer, that time, as he says, is out of joint or out of date, and that the only thing we may think of under the name of temporality is the expectation of the utterly other, an expectation deprived of any horizon, of any structure of expectation, what he will also call a messianicity without messianism. So the critique of form, once again, um, came at the same time uh, as this messianic vision of time. We find also this um, definition of time as this messianic opening in Giorgio Agamben, for example, uh, where in, well, in a book called um, Creation and Anarchy, Agamben talks about time as this pure passive expectation opening to the event, etc. So it seemed to me that just as the dismissal of form had to be challenged, this vision of time also had to be challenged. When openness is infinite, then everything in reality is closed. And what is closed is time, future, and change. And I felt the need to re, uh, try to re-interrogate the possibility of uh, elaborating a philosophy of time. Plasticity and later epigenesis, epigenetics, but even also the destruction of my uh, previous views with artificial intelligence, helped me to re-engage a concept of material time, a temporality that would be situated at the crossing of philosophy, history, and biology. Uh, it seemed to me that such a temporality, such a re-elaboration of temporality was indispensable if we want to elaborate a, a new vision of the part played by human beings, not only in the social and political realm, but also in the life and death of the earth. How can we think of something like the Anthropocene without the help of a renewed concept of time? And this is also a question that I uh, raised against speculative realism. Just, so just to, to bring this presentation to a close, I would like to um, quote a book that I found very interesting. It's already a bit old. It's the book uh, written by Axel Honneth, co-author, co-authored by Axel Honneth and Nancy Fraser. It's called Redistribution of or Recognition. It's a question, in fact, Redistribution or Recognition from 2003. And in this book, Honneth has, asks himself what an expectation is. Do expectations proceed from pre-established principle that, as he says, the subjects bring in a certain way on their own? Or are they pure openings to something that can only come from outside? So do we bring our own answers to our expectations with us? Or do we expect something totally surprising and unpredictable? It seems to me that the notion of a plastic transcendental as a reinterpretation of the Kantian epigenesis of reason may perhaps help to offer an intermediary kind of answer. I would, I would say that the space in which I try to work is the one that situates itself between predestination and the pure event, between the genetic code and the epigenetic mechanism, between uh, natural plasticity and cybernetic plasticity. So in between predestination and the pure event, there lies the space of the form, which is halfway between necessity and chance. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope it was clear. <laughs> yes, very clear. It's amazing. Thank you so much, Catherine, for this uh, intellectual self uh, portrait. Uh, it was just, not easy to do, I must say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's fairly clear, and I can tell you because I I know your work, and so that's yes, this is obvious for me to see that all this uh, this terms, uh, this uh, revision of your uh, <coughs> focus 
and that's yes, it's striking. It and it also it, it strikes me to 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 hear how you have always this uh, leading thread by plasticity, and uh, then we can uh, follow your uh, your inventive uh, thoughts, uh, even if you focus on different uh, fields. Uh, there is this yes, this and uh, this plasticity, and uh, so. Uh, the, uh, the plasticity is your subject, but also a kind of process, uh, <laughs> even until it makes you reinvent and sometimes explode. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. yeah, so th thank you so much. And uh, well, there are already a uh, question on the, in the Q&A. And uh, please feel... Uh, um... Ah, yes, okay, I see them. So uh, I should just uh, read them and ask you some question first. <laughs> That's my privilege. Okay, Catherine. Ah, yes, of course. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I thought you wanted me to read the. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because I remember hearing you saying that uh, a philosopher has always, of course, you were speaking about you, but always one concept uh, in uh, her or his work. And uh, how could you explain why? And could you explain how you got this uh, intuition uh, of this? Because, of course, th in this res retrospective view, it's a kind of also a trick because, well, there are, of course, some contingency of thinking. And uh, so you gave uh, that. So that was wonderful uh, logic uh, interpret uh, explanation of uh, your uh, path, your journey in philosophy. But um, Yes, could you say something about the the the, the what what it means for you the, the the and for you I mean in your psyche and in, and in your work the the, the 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 discovery or the invention mm -hmm. the, the intuition of plasticity until now that's 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 amazing. Thank you very much, François. Um, so first of all, I, I wouldn't say perhaps if I said that I was wrong. I wouldn't say that. A thinker has only one concept, perhaps not one concept, but one idea, which is not exactly the same. I would say that the concept is a fetishization of the idea. So it is true that plasticity can, can be seen as my fetish. Uh, people I know of, often say, oh, Malibu is always about plasticity because it's easy to, uh, to reduce, well, if, we, if you have an idea, you, you have, of course, to express it. And in that sense, you need a concept. But it is important to see the idea behind the concept. So in order to, to define what an idea is, which is, a, I would like to refer to what Jean-Luc Marion says in one of his, of, it, of his book, the last one, one of the last ones about uh, Descartes' passions, you know, the, the, the book he wrote about the treaties of passions. And it says in the preface that a philosopher has only one point of departure. He, he calls the idea a point of departure. And he says, some of them, a few of them has have two. So it's either one or two, but never more than that. Uh, and he situates Descartes in the second category. Um, Descartes with this theory of passions, changing his mind about the role of the body, etc. And this is this vision of a philosopher um, struck and stuck to one unique idea is very, very common in philosophy. You find it in Heidegger, you find it in Marion, you find it in Hegel. Uh, I think it's a point of departure and, and a kind of uh, general design. It's a form, precisely. Uh, so why plasticity for me? Why, why did, because as I tried to, to explain in the beginning, I was raised in deconstruction, Derrida was my mentor and everything was fantastic, I mean, uh, very interesting, was fascinating, but at the same time, I felt prisoner of deconstruction. And I had to find a way of uh, getting out, <laughs> uh, 
of that. And as you know, it is impossible to, frankly, oppose deconstruction. Uh, it is totally reactive, and it was not my, my goal. Because I didn't want to oppose it, it wouldn't have make any sense. I just wanted to find my own way, not because I wanted to be original, but because I was uh, stifling in, in this, you know, everything you said was all, oh, it's already deconstructed, it's, it was always reduced to presence, etc. So I had to find a way to, I had to find a detour. And plasticity appeared to me as the capacity to transform what apparently is totally rigid and fixed. It gave me confidence in the uh, capacity to transform a situation and to compose, to, to, keep, to keep with you the thing you want to transform and to subvert it at the same time. So it was a logic of transformation made of preservation and subversion. Uh, yes, uh, in, including against myself. I think this is very important. So it's a tool, it's a process, you're right. Uh, okay, so there are uh, different questions. Do you want me to read them or do you want to? Uh... As you prefer. No, it's a, yes, it's you a... can read them if you, if you don't mind. I mean. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, but I have the, the, the feeling that it's the same person asking. Am I right? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, I think that we, are, we, we you won't have uh, time enough to 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 answer all the questions. So I choose okay. um, just uh, one or two. And uh, so, uh, how does a, a human maintain their sense of identity through time? Isn't it the DNA genetic code that remains immutable through all the the epigenetic sculpting of the human form? Yes, thank you. This is a very interesting uh, question. Uh, it depends on what you call the identity. If you call identity uh, the biological structure of an individual, of course, the DNA guarantees the stability. But if you think of, uh, let's say, consciousness, um, the, the feeling of myself hmm, as an identical being, no, it doesn't depend entirely on the DNA genetic code. Hmm? Of course not. It depends on um, the stability of my consciousness, which is a specific function of the brain. And this specific function is in a certain sense genetically determined because it happens in certain regions of the brain, but also totally open to external influences, etc. Because otherwise, uh, I would not be able to integrate the different uh, experiences I have, the different events I'm living in this identity. So I have to be in a certain way open, uh, plastically open to time. And this is not genetic. This is cultural, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, perhaps a last question by, uh, mm -hmm. from, uh, from uh, Yanis. Yanis? Yanis. Uh, oh, but about truth. I like how you deconstructed the pretentious absolute of what we call reality. Do you think truth is another highbrow uh, and much co-opted and abused term that we should also abandon under the specter of plasticity? So what about? So this is thank you, Yanis. This is also an immense question, which is if ev everything is plastic, <laughs> is there any kind of possible well, any possible kind of truth? And so um, in uh, what should we do with our brain, I made this strong distinction between plasticity and flexibility. Flexibility meaning that a material can be torn in all directions, bent in all directions. A plasticity on the contrary uh, me, uh, designates um, the, well, the capacity to be formed, but not to not be able to return to the initial form once sculpted. For example, once you have the sculpture, the sculpture cannot go back to its initial uh, marble uh, materiality. It means that, uh, of course, um, our ideas, our concepts, our visions, etc. change, but there is something like a truth in those changes to the extent that when the form takes, uh, when it solidifies itself, 
creates values, it creates uh, benchmarks, uh, solutions as well. Uh, and in that sense, truth is not incompatible with plasticity because plasticity is not the capacity to say anything, to go in all directions. Plasticity is the formation of, of a form that, uh, as you mentioned with identity, keeps its own identity through time. And I think this is uh, totally compatible with truth. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, from Adam Jones, thank you so much for your talk, uh, Catherine. I have two questions. What are the ethical consequences of affirming the plastic nature of personal form and personal bodily identity as it relates to our capacities to change and transgress against given identities? Secondly, uh, does, it, does this open up new sites of resistance within the, traditional, the traditionally essentialist field of biology? Well, thank you, Adam. Adam is a one of my Kingston students. So hello, Adam. Uh, thanks for being here. So, um, well, it depends. The first part of your question, as you know, we should distinguish between ethics and morals. It is true that we, we call morals um, a series of dogmas. Uh, morals is, is a set of rules. Ethics is more about norms, uh, as Foucault uh, has demonstrated. And if we think of ethical norms, then we necessarily uh, discover their plasticity. Uh, and ethics can only be plastic, it is not contradictory. Because for example, when we, let me take an example, like for example, the, the movements like Me Too or uh, all the recent struggles against dominations, etc. There are new forms of uh, fights, of struggles, and they need new ethical norms that were not at the center of the ethical uh, preoccupations of people like 50 years ago. So we can see that the ethical questions and the ethical norms are evolving. So in that sense, plasticity and ethics are not incompatible. And of course, uh, the second part of your question, uh, absolutely, um, plastic, a plastic vision of biology is definitely opposed to um, the essentialist vision of uh, uh, wholly determined, genetically determined uh, body, mind, etc. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. A field that is uh, unfortunately very strong. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Catherine, yeah. I, I would like to ask you a, a question more general about the situation of philosophy today, because uh, that's also yeah. the purpose of this uh, series to well to understand the, the situation of philosophy of contemporary philosophy in, in Europe or uh, in the United States so uh, well you 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 are used to to cross borders no uh, I mean philosophical borders uh, uh, crossing for example uh, you know the, the science and uh, <laughs> psychoanalysis and uh, in very original ways and uh, well cr but you also uh, cross uh, borders because yes. you 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 teach uh, well you, you taught in france but also in england and, and in the united states could you tell us what you think about the situation of philosophy in these countries uh, and uh, you mean in, uh, in england and in, in the United States and in France, the, the, well, the, 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 the dialogue or what's your feeling about uh, the, the, the situation of philosophy today? Uh, well, um, first of all, I don't think that French philosophy uh, still belongs to France. Uh, I discovered that with Derrida already, it was a bit shocking for me in the beginning because I thought that uh, France was the, you know, the native land of a certain kind of philosophy. I think that the important French philosophers today are abroad. And that's, well, so I, I don't have time to explain uh, all the reasons for such a situation, but I think that definitely, it perhaps means that there is, um, um, a global, I mean, philosophy is becoming global in the sense that there are a few questions hmm, that uh, are shared 
by, I would say, I, I, I'm not saying that they are universal, but they are shared as questions by, I would say, the community of philosophers today, uh, whatever their nationality or, you know, and so that's the Frenchity, la francité of philosophy is for me, it doesn't make any sense anymore. So what are these, what is this core of questions? So these questions are uh, developed very differently. You know, there's no universality once again, but what are they today? I would say the real, uh, the ecological crisis, I, I, I quote that in disorder, huh? um, race, cultural differences, um, artificial intelligence and, and technology, and the, let's say the status of metaphysics. Huh? I would say that these questions, and, and of course, I forgot the, the main one, the political, which is, is there an alternative um, economic system than capitalism? Huh? and what will become of capitalism, etc. So I would say that these questions are um, outside or under the very different ways of uh, their address. For example, Bruno Latour is very different from Meyasu, and Meyasu is very different from, I don't know, um, uh, from Judith Butler or from even an analytic philosopher like Robert Brandom, or, you know, there are perhaps incompatibilities between these people, but at the same time, I would say that there is a, a global state of philosophical questions. Um, it is impossible, I, I would say, today to uh, think of something like a national uh, philosophy which was still possible when I was young, you know, because in France, we thought that we were a nation of philosophers and that we had specifically French ways of addressing. Um... Okay, Catherine, but there was still the, the question, the issue of the language you, you used to, to write and to, to think. And so would you say yet that uh, French is still your philosophical language? Of, of course, I mean, I'm very French. I have this very strong accent. I'm very French, but uh, honestly, um, I feel like a, a French uh, woman in the di diaspora. I feel totally diasporic. And uh, I must say that translations uh, the translation of, my, of some of my works into English, for example, or other languages have been uh, a tremendous experience. Uh, of course, I'm French, but I could not, even if I wanted, go back uh, to, you know, my, my young years of experience when I was this French, I, I, I would not, I could not uh, be put, you know, like the a cork of a bottle of champagne that you cannot put back in the bottle. I mean, of course I speak French, and so, but I don't think that any national, once again, even if each, if each country has, of course, its uh, spirit. Hmm? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, well, the space of philosophy has widened. Okay, okay. And I say that, well, you... <coughs> You, you like to, to cross the borders and uh, well regarding the the you know the fight between well continental and uh, analytic uh, philosophy uh, well you what, what would you say today is there still a, a, such a, a difference hmm. of language and of well yes I think I do think that um, there is still a strong rift. Uh, between the two traditions, uh, undoubtedly. But at the same time, it, it is true that crossing borders, as you said, helped me to understand them better. I mean, the, the people from the other, <laughs> the other side of the... Um, and that, for example, as I said, the new, the new issues, particularly the global crisis, the global climate crisis, 
is at the same time erasing those borders because even analytic philosophers are confronted with, with the questions I was uh, mentioning. Um, and for example, uh, uh, when I talked about speculative realism, speculative realism is interesting because it brings together the two traditions. So if you want to answer them, to discuss with these people, the representatives of this trend, you have to do a little bit of both. Uh, yes, so I would say that even if the divide is still strong, the questions are becoming more and more common to, the, to all the philosophers. Okay, okay. Uh, Catherine, uh, well, it's the, 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 the end, quite the end of uh, this meeting. So could you say a word about your uh, most uh, recent uh, books, uh, either the, the book uh, on, uh, on clitoris or uh, either the, the, your uh, next book on uh, anarchy? So uh, I didn't want to, uh, to talk about them because um, anarchy is in the making. So... Uh, it, it is another extension of plasticity because anarchism for me is understood in a certain sense, the translation of plasticity in politics. It is a, a political situation in which nothing is programmed, in which invention, well, it, it, anarchy requires an invention of a form. And about the clitoris, so the clitoris book is um, a prolongation of um, my first feminist book, which was Changing Difference. Uh, it is also linked with anarchism because my conclusion, my, my conclusion, I say, uh, the clitoris is an anarchist. So it is a book against uh, domination. It is a book that um, advocates the freedom for uh, feminine pleasure, etc. So it's, it's an exploration of feminism that shares, of course, many many points with my previous works. Uh, so yes, I, I didn't, I, I thought I, I wouldn't have time to explore um, all the, uh, yes, the aspects of my most recent books. Catherine, thank you so much. Well, thank you, uh, Francois, it was great. It was a good exercise. And see you soon. Uh, at yes, thank you all for listening. Okay, bye-bye, Francois. Bye-bye, all. Oh.